So that's the charge he levies at those of us who do sit and study. But it is a valid juridical issue. If you're sitting and studying Bible all the time and you're applying it in whatever comes up in your life because you have to wait for God to present you with situations. I mean, you've got a certain set of facts and circumstances. There are a whole lot of exigencies in your life. So you got a lot of stuff you got to do anyway. But you don't go looking for the good deeds. You have things you ought to do, and you use Bible to determine what those are. So God sends you all of your circumstances. Because it's training. That's your training ground. It's just like you're in the CIA, and they put you through the paces. They do it to you. And you really are in the CIA. You're in the, uh, what do you want to call it? The Church Intelligence Agency. You can come up with some better name. I'm not smart right now. But it is still a valid question. And you're going to have it on your mind all the time and everybody's going to bring it up to you too. Like one lady said to me, you could have spent all that time you spent on Bible. You could have gotten a PhD in chemistry or something. And help the world. Why didn't you do that? So let's answer that question. There are two universes going on here. There's the world. Which for trial purposes. There is a disclosure about this other universe that's called heaven. But. The kind of disclosure that it is is just enough that you're free to say yes and free to say no which means that you're not being hit over the head every day at noon with an angel flying overhead giving you the gospel that happens in Revelation 14 but it's not, it's not happening now so you have a reasonable doubt you have a way to say no without being basically hit over the head like the people in the tribulation are going to be hit over the head. That's when everybody gets hit over the head, but not now. So that's one universe. And you're in it. This world. What are you doing for the world? Well, you can't be doing a whole heck of a lot if you're busy learning and living on Bible because that's pretty solitary. You basically have to limit, I mean, in order to do this right, you got to limit your relationships. Because, you know, every relationship costs time. you got to limit your relationships. you got to carve out time to study. You're going to need to be alone a lot because a lot of the kind of practice that you're going to need is in thinking. So, you know, some of your relatives... You're not going to be spending as much time with them as they want, of course. That's always true. So, you're not really doing a whole lot with respect to helping the world physically. You're more or less just trying to keep body and soul together. And you want as much free time as possible to study Bible the more you learn it, the more you're going to want to. So yeah, you're not out there doing the bizarre thing. You're not out there cleaning the pews. You're not out there running charities and so winning. So how are you helping the world? You're pretty much insular. Yeah, like Christ kept walking away from the crowds and kept going off to pray kept talking nasty to people who baited him or didn't talk to him at all spent 30 years with, in complete obscurity even after he was announced by some shepherds you saw him 
talk the same day he was born, then nothing. Big black spot. Till about 29 years later, John the Baptist starts wandering around the Jordan, telling everybody Christ is going to come. About a year after that, he actually goes into the Jordan and is baptized by John. Of course, immediately or soon after that, John's put in prison by Herod. Three years in a dusty little country. He just walks and talks. And he's gone. Hmm. What'd he do for the world? Well, nothing that you could see. That was Satan's big argument in Matthew 4. You could feed the whole world. You could jump off the temple. Everybody would believe in you and they'd be saved. Don't you care if people are saved? And hey, you know what? I'll just die right now. Here, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. And I know that's going to make you mad that I even said it. So you'll zap me and I'll go straight to hell, but I'll have the happiness of knowing that I'm the real Savior because I made you zap me in order to get those kingdoms of the world and avoid the cross. And then I'm the real Savior because I caused you to do that. Yeah. So he didn't do a whole lot, did he? Not that anybody could see. And that is the point. Whose good deeds should they be? Number one, whose good deeds? God's or yours? Second question, who should the good deeds be for? Who should get the good deeds? Now, you got two objects. Who should you be doing good deeds for? First of all, who should be doing the good deeds? Because it's a big question like, how good is it if it's you doing it versus God doing it? That's been the focus of these audios. Okay, but now we're going to flip the question around a little bit. Who, for whom should you be doing good deeds? Who should be the object? Then you can, you know, it's a typical answer and it's intuitive. Well, for my family, my clients, the people I owe money to, I should do good stuff for them, yeah. Isn't there anybody else? How about God? Oh, well, yeah, of course. Everybody's going to say, well, of course for God. If I do these good deeds for people, I'm doing it for God. Well, really? Does God need um, peanut butter? Did he need you to give money to charity? Is whatever you did for your spouse or your employer or the neighbor next door who ran out of a cup of ran out of sugar? Did God need you to do any of that? And then you'll say, well, but, but, but Christ said in the, when you do this for the least of any of these humans, you're doing it for me. Yeah. But what about your thoughts? Every thought you ever think is right in front of God all the time. Is it doing God any good that you have all these thoughts about Mrs. McGillicuddy and whether or not her bloomers were showing at the Sunday school picnic? My favorite book on this is Ulysses by James Joyce. Boy, this really hits home. Go read that book if you want to understand what I'm talking about here. Because it's he, what he does, he writes this book about this guy's thinking. To expose how human thinking is so disgusting. How about the time that uh, you put ten dollars in the collection plate and Johnny was right next to you put in a hundred and fifty? Ooh, that didn't make you feel good. 
Yeah, and that moment God saw that, it stank. Hmm. So, okay, fine, you gave a cup of sugar to your next door neighbor. While you were giving the cup of sugar, you were kind of ticked off at being put out. But you smiled. Hypocritically. God's going to know every thought in your head and every thought in our heads like that book by James Ulysses, James Joyce, Ulysses. Oh, what a book that is. Our thoughts are petty. They're all centered on the world, our bodies, the people around us. Our puny little interests, our puny little moralities. What is that doing for God? Most humans can infer but not really see what you're thinking, but God always sees what you're thinking. It's in His face 24 7. So, how is what you're thinking? going to be compensated for by the little things you do for somebody other than God who didn't need you to do them. Not at all. So, if you're supposed to be doing good deeds, and of course, the first question is how good is it if it's you doing it rather than God doing it? If you're doing it and not God doing it, then it's not really that good. Secondly, what kind of deeds are you doing for God? Literally, what can you do for God? Seriously. Anything I do with this body, I'm doing for myself or some other human. That's all it can ever be. And it's mostly wasted, small, petty, meaningless, temporary, and it's got to be done in five more minutes and it's going to die in five seconds because it'll get tainted or dust on it. Oh, I vacuum the floor and got to do it again in a couple of days or a week. As if it never got done the first time. Meanwhile... I got all these thoughts in my head that are based on my own thinking. And God is going to see that in front of His face all the time. He sees what I do too. But the thinking is going to live forever because I do. Now, God happens to care a whole lot about thinking. Christ said, it's what comes out of your mouth, not what goes into your mouth that defiles you. He said, the widow who put in the two mites put in more money than the guy before her who put in a whole talent because of what she was thinking. Isaiah 53, 11 says, because of what Christ was thinking, it was his thinking that paid for sins. Oh. Oh, wait a minute. God deemed Christ's thinking to pay. Oh. God's saying that thinking is worth something. That thinking can pay. Thinking, not what I do with this body. Mm, that sure isn't like what Christianity expects spirituality to be. They think Christ died physically in order to pay for sins. Ooh, really? That's not what the Bible says. Well, then, thinking is worth a whole lot to God if it was what God said paid for sins. And whose thinking was that? Christ's. Okay, so if Christ's own thinking paid for sins to God, then there is something you can do for God. Have Christ's thinking. 
Oh, yeah, because if it paid for sins, then it was really pleasing to God, pleasing enough for Him to allow me to be born in the first place and sin in the second place. Okay, well, then if He puts His thinking in me, well, that's going to please Him, isn't it? So I can do something for God. Yeah, he says so, see Hebrews eleven six. Apart from faith, it is impossible to please him. Now, faith means pistis. I've gone over this before. It means doctrine in your head that you believe. So it means it's got to get into your head and you got to believe it. And of course, when it's in your head and you believe it, that means it's still working. It's operating. So instead of all those petty thoughts like James Joyce records in the book Ulysses, God starts hearing all these doctrine thoughts. And the first time he taught me this importance, I was pacing like I am now, only I was in a living room, and the thought that he used to get it through to me I'm going to say to you, because maybe he'll do it again to you. Matthew 4.4, 4, always occurring. That was the exact thought he sent me when I was pondering this. You know, what was it, 11 years ago? Matthew 4.4, 4, always occurring. I have not been the same person since I learned that. Now think about what that means. What does Matthew 4, 4 say? You live and learn on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. What's that? The Bible. And what does always occurring mean? He, he loves giving me truncated, pithy collections of keywords all over. Okay, and then he just, it's like sending a zip file. It's like all the whole comprehension of what that means and all of its associated doctrines all just sort of link up like a puzzle where I see the whole picture. So you can too. You understand Matthew 4 4, right? You live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Bible is the Word of God. You got that. Now, what is always occurring then? God is omniscient. When you were born, the very second you were born, in time the way you and I experience it, that moment is long gone. But that moment is forever alive to omniscience. If God wanted to, he could excise that moment. And it would not be alive to omniscience. But of course, if he did that, then you wouldn't be alive either. Hope you understand that. This is kind of the price of being God. He could stop being God, but he won't. And what keeps getting to me is, why won't? Why does he, how can he stand being God? I just that that I just don't get it. How can he enjoy being God? Because that moment that you were born is in his omniscience, it is still happening. It is a live moment. It never stops. It's like groundhog day. Except it's not recurring, it just doesn't end. It's just there. Like I've said before, it's like dots on a Georges Seurat painting. When you get close to like his picture, a, sun, a Sunday in the park, I think it's Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon in the park. Okay, if you stood up real close to that painting, you'd see that he painted it. He just kept hitting the canvas with little dots, kind of like acupuncture, except he didn't puncture. He, he, used, he actually kept hitting the canvas with dots. Him, I, I don't know, he should have gotten carpal tunnel or something from making that one painting. And all those dots are individual dots, and they're all there on the canvas. And you have to sort of step back from the painting in order to see, you know, how beautiful it is.
it's a, it's an extreme work of art from the technical standpoint of the difficulty of doing something like that. And I like that style anyway, but not the dotting technique. That was really hard to do. That's how time looks to God. All the dots, every dot of every moment is right like on a canvas that he's not only seeing as it were like looking at a television screen, but he's in it. Meaning his mind is in it. You know, because he takes up no space, so he's not physically in anything because there's no physicality to Godness. Okay, and that stresses the fact that thinking matters because there is no physicality to Godness. There's nothing physical you can do that will be physically pleasing because it's physical, it's limited, it dies. Okay, so you can please God by thinking like Christ, which means learning Christ, precept on precept, dot on dot on dot on dot. And every moment you do is forever alive to omniscience. That's that day when I learned, I, I got it. Matthew 4, 4, always occurring. Yeah, the moment I'm learning doctrine or I'm thinking doctrine, I might be going to the bathroom. I might be having a headache. I might be passing out. You know, because I overwork. I might be having gas. Because I'm allergic to everything. I might be washing the dishes. I might have just saved a client half a million dollars. Whatever it is I'm doing in this body that the world would consider, you know, menial, stupid, ugly, smelly, or valuable. Well, that doesn't mean anything to God. He doesn't need any of that. Oh, but if I'm thinking doctrine at the same time, just as Christ thinking on the cross paid for sins. And the smell, that's the Old Testament metaphor for this. The smell goes up to God. Ola. The offering, the smell, it's really referring to the smoke that goes up and the smell of the smoke of the burning meat. The pleasingness of that smell. The pleasing smell of our thinking when we're thinking like Christ. The pleasing aroma of thinking something that has to do with what your Bible study or a principle or a question you're having or you're talking with God while you do whatever it is you do with your body. That's pleasing to Him. That's him inserting himself into the thing. And you're now engaged in, through him of course, because only he can make this actually work. I'm picking up a can, or not a can, but a, uh, I don't know, canister of pepper. Ooh, and I'm almost out of pepper. Uh-oh. I'll have to do something about that. And at the same time, I'm talking on the recorder. About who? God. So, that moment when I picked up the canister of pepper that's almost out, forever be associated with this audio. And God will forever see it. Now, which would he rather see? A moment where you're learning something, or you're asking something, or you're trying to do something that's connected to the Bible, no matter how much you're trying to fail. And it doesn't matter that you fail. It matters that you try. Is he going to be more pleased with that? Or is he going to be more pleased with a thought that doesn't have anything to do with him? No matter how moral it is. Would you be more pleased with a thought that's consonant with your own values? That you see your kid apply to his finger painting. Well, finger painting is not going to be any good, okay. And back in the 1950s, what we used to do is we used to take sweetheart soap. They were, they were like, they, sweetheart soap looked like big Easter eggs. 
And we, we got these little decals. I don't know how I don't know how anybody could come up with such a stupid idea. We got all these decals and we would paste them. <laughs> this is really dumb. We got all these decals and we would paste them on sweetheart soap so it looked like this huge Easter egg. It was really ugly, okay. And we pasted them with all these decals, and on Mother's Day, we gave them to our mothers. This is, you know, mid-California America. Lower, you know, Southern California America, valley girl kind of stuff in the 1950s. And our mothers would go, ooh, that is so pretty. It was awful. But they said it was pretty because you know what they liked? The thought that counts. The kid was trying to do something for mommy, and the kid had absolutely no sense whatsoever. At least this kid had no sense about how to make a bar of soap. Not a bar, but it's like an Easter egg of soap. Attractive with decals. You know, your chubby little kid's fingers can't exactly put the little decals on the soap very attractively. So it was either masked up with stars on one side or glommed up with other little sun things on another side. And the kid was so happy. Oh, Mommy, I made a gift for Mommy. Okay, the gift was really ugly. And the first time you used the soap, all the decals would fall off and be all over the bottom of the shower. And it would take you 15 hours to clean it up, not counting the goop of the glue. But the kid... The thought that the kid had, I want to do for mommy. That was priceless. And you get to spend the 15 hours you're cleaning the tub thinking about how the kid meant well. You see the point? You're trying to use Bible on the microwave or the dishes or your email. And you're screwing it up. But you're trying. How attractive is that compared to anything else you can be thinking and doing in this body?